into one component system. Uh, up to now, with the three chapters we've done, first law, second law, and equilibrium potentials, and then the sort of mathematical structure, you've essentially seen pretty much all you need to know. This is really all there is to classical thermodynamics. There is one, uh, one piece that we didn't cover, which is what's called stability theory, uh, which has to do with the sign of the properties. Things, for example, proving that the heat capacity has to be positive, that compressibility has to be positive. Uh, so there are certain requirements on the matrix of second derivatives, essentially on its determinant, and that's what's called stability theory. Uh, we didn't cover that. You're welcome to read about that. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's an important physical aspect because if we lived in a world where thermal expand, uh, where uh, heat capacity was negative, some very strange stuff would happen. Uh, but it's not something we're going to cover uh, in this lecture. So, so the last part before we head into statistical mechanics is on um, phase transitions and one component systems. Although towards the end of the lecture, which will be on Friday, um, I will generalize this to multi-component systems. So we're going to mostly operate at constant TNP. So an environment controlled by temperature and pressure, those will be our handles that, that we will use to change uh, stability of phases. And what that means is that uh, in this environment, we will be looking for the states, or in our case, phases of materials with the lowest Gibbs free energy. And then if you want to change the situation, let's say we're in a, in, a, in a temperature and pressure regime where one phase has the lowest free energy, so it's stable. If you want to change the situation, we have to look at how does G of each phase change. And there we've done the heavy lifting already because we know that the optimized free energy of each state is minus S D varies as minus S D T plus V D P. So this is a powerful statement because it tells us how we can use temperature and pressure to influence us the free energy of phases, right? It's telling you that is if you have a high positive entropy, then making the temperature go up will lower the Gibbs free energy. It tells you that if you have a small volume, then increasing the pressure will make the free energy go up less. And so from this, we will figure out how, um, how we can influence different phases. So how would you find phase boundaries between materials? So here's a picture um, out of Callan. And in principle, you could, you could plot, um, they call it mu here, but you really could just as well call it G, right? So you would plot G as a function of temperature and pressure, and you could do a, a, f a free energy surface like that for two phases, say, um, you know, here's, for example, they did solid, and here they do liquid. And then you just look at where they intersect, right? So here is the, inter here is the intersection plotted, and wherever one phase is the lowest is the domain where that phase is stable. So in this area, liquid is stable. In this area, solid is stable. 
because these these curves usually cross over these surfaces you, you should say cross over with different derivatives the derivative is discontinuous at the boundary so for example if I move from this surface here if I move from this surface here to this one right so I move from the liquid to the solid at the phase transition I have a discontinuity which means I have a delta V at the transition and I have a delta S. And this means you have a discrete volume change at the transition. And the fact that you have a delta S means that you have a heat exchange. And this is what you're familiar with, right? So at phase transitions, you have a volume change, right? Think of famous example of ice freezing in a bottle. Uh, it expands its volume as it goes through the solidification transition. And, and phase transitions, of course, have latent heat. Like when you boil water, you have to put in a, a large amount of heat. Um, we'll see later, that these are examples of what are called first order transitions things where the first derivatives are discontinuous. I want to make a few more statements about these um, free energy curves. How do they look like? So let me restate here the differential. So um, since S is positive, that means that this free energy decreases with temperature. And since V is also positive, that means that Gibbs free energy um, increases with pressure. You can even make a statement about the second derivative uh, so the question is, are these curves convex or concave? Uh, because CP is T dS dt. And this is positive. And S is the first derivative. So that means that the second derivative, d squared g dt squared, is negative. So Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature goes down, but is concave. Right. So, so if you draw free energy curves, try to draw them with the proper curvature, right? Downward and concave. Uh, for, for Gibbs free energy with respect to volume, sorry, pressure, we know that they have to go upward, but the question is what's the second derivative? Well, the second derivative comes from the compressibility beta t, which is minus one over v dv dp at constant t, and v is the first derivative. So that means that the second derivative, d squared g dp squared, is actually also negative. So the Gibbs free energy goes up with pressure, but again, concave. So let me do a very simple example. Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature for phases of water. And we're doing P constant. So the solid would have the lowest entropy, so it would have the lowest curvature downward. So let's say this is G of the solid. The liquid would have higher curvature, 
because it's higher entropy. So this would be the free energy of the liquid. And then the vapor would have the highest entropy, and this would be the free energy of the vapor. So we would have two phase transitions. Right here we would go from solid being the lowest to liquid being the lowest. This would be uh, the melting point. And here we go from liquid being the lowest So to vapor being low, so this would be the boiling point. Uh, curves don't always have to behave this way. Um, the liquid curve doesn't have to cut the solid before it cuts uh, the vapor. Uh, the liquid curve could lie here. And what would happen now is you would never have a melting point, right? If this were the liquid, you would only have this point as a transition and you would go straight from solid to vapor. So that would be a sublimation point. Um, so GT is not linear. And this is important to keep in mind because for something to be linear, its second derivative has to be zero. And what's the second derivative? The second derivative is the heat capacity. And the heat capacity is certainly not zero. That was coffee drinking on cue, thank you. Um, but sometimes the, Gibbs, the free energy difference can be linearized. So often, um, you can linearize delta G as a function of T, where delta G is the, the free energy of, say, one phase. I'll call it alpha, generally. Minus the free energy of another phase. And let me give you an example of that. So I'm going to calculate. I'm going to estimate the boiling point of water from data that I take at room temperature. So the question is, what is T boiling uh, for H2O if I only have data at room temperature? Right? So I'm, I actually don't know what the boiling point is. I have no enthalpies, no entropies there. But at 293 Kelvin, I have data. I has data. So delta H in going from liquid to vapor, I looked up, is 44.17 kilojoules per mole. And delta S going from liquid to vapor is 119.5 joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay, so that's all I know. So how do I use that to try to figure out what the melting point is? Uh, sorry, boiling point is. Well, let me define delta G as the free energy difference between um, I'm going to define this as uh, G liquid minus G vapor, or sort of G vapor minus G liquid, right? Um, and this is a function of temperature, and I have to find the temperature where this is zero. That's where the liquid and the vapor have the same Gibbs free energy. So I can write this as delta H minus T delta S. Is that linear? It's not, right? Because these themselves are a function of T. So it looks linear, but it's not, right? 
It's not because you just see the explicit T there. But if I assume delta H and delta S to be temperature independent, then I can easily find the boiling point because then the boiling point is, so the approximate boiling point is delta H divided by delta S. And let me put in some numbers. So that's 44,170 joules per mole per Kelvin, joules per mole, and this is 119 joules per mole per Kelvin. So th this is 370 K. So I'm only off by three degrees. And I used to play music here, there used, there's a band called the Three Degrees, old Motown band, but um, you're way too young to know the Three Degrees. So um, people didn't appreciate my sense of music. But it's remarkable, right? You're only off by three degrees, even though I only use room temperature data. So what is this really telling us? It's really telling us that, that I can, fairly well linearize the free energy difference as a function of temperature. So what is the physical approximation I really have made here? When I say that, right, the, the approximation comes here, right? This statement is always true, but it's, I would have to take delta H and delta S at the boiling point. But what I do instead, I take them from the room temperature data. So the statement I have made, running out of board space. Okay, you're okay, right, if I write a little, this is very professorial to like squeeze in because I wanna keep my picture. Um, what's the approximation I make when I say, really what I'm saying is that the temperature derivative of delta H, that that's zero, right? That's what I've said, right? And the same for the entropy derivative. It's the derivative of the delta S with respect to T is zero. What have I said? What is this D delta H DT? This is delta CP, right? The derivative, if you go way back to your lectures, like way back from a week ago, two weeks ago, the derivative of enthalpy with respect to temperature at constant pressure is heat capacity. So what you're saying here is that delta CP is zero. And actually, you can prove exactly the same thing for this. So the two, the two assumptions are actually only one assumption. What you've assumed is that delta CP is zero. So you've assumed that the heat capacities of both phases are the same. And as we've seen in terms of heat capacities, that's actually not a bad approximation, right? Heat capacities are always sort of in the same ballpark per mole of atoms or per, um, you know, they're sort of like 3R. So the, the difference in heat capacity between phases is usually not that large. And that's what linearizes the free energy difference between them, right? Not the free energy itself, because the curvature here is the heat capacity, but the difference. And that's why this works so well. Okay, wake up now. Now comes one of the most useful equations I'm ever gonna tell you. Because thermo is great, but as you can sort of figure out, you always need data, right? Well, in some cases, I'm gonna show you that you can almost make up the data. So um, there's an extremely useful extrapolation curve for delta G. So delta G is now the free energy difference between two phases. By the way, thermodynamics is full of deltas, right? It has different meanings in different contexts, right? Sometimes, you know, delta is by definition the difference between two things. Just to make sure you always know what those two things are. You know, sometimes we write delta H and sometimes we mean, oh, it's the difference between the high temperature enthalpy and the low temperature enthalpy. 
sometimes delta H means the enthalpy difference between two phases across a phase boundary. So don't get thrown off by this, right? Make sure you understand what your symbols mean. Anyway, after that preaching, um, there is, we usually don't know what delta G is um, because there's no tables for Gibbs free energy, but where we usually know it is at a phase transition or at the phase transition between the two phases because there it's zero. I'm gonna write this now as TPT for phase transition, right? So at the phase transition is zero by definition. And at the phase transition, you usually know what delta H is because that's usually the thing that's tabulated, the latent heat uh, of transformation, the enthalpy difference. So delta H at the phase transition is usually known. That means we can also get delta S because since delta G is zero, this is equal to the temperature at the phase transition times delta S at the phase transition. It's PT here, come on. So that means if I, I can linearize delta G as a function of temperature, I'll linearize it as delta H minus T delta S. And I know that this is zero at the phase transition. So that means it's approximately equal to delta H at the phase transition. I'll substitute in what delta S is times one minus T over T of the phase transition. I'll tell you, this is super useful. I use this all the time. Because, you know, you'll often wanna know what the free energy difference is between phases away from the phase transition because you'll wanna estimate like their solubility variations. Uh, you'll wanna estimate shifts in melting points you can induce. And, and people always go and look for data and they can't find data on Gibbs free energies, but this is remarkably useful, right? Um, this is a good way to extrapolate free energy differences away from phase transitions. I'll use that equation a lot in the third part of the course, but you know, there might be an earlier time when it comes up handy, like in about a week or something like that, you know, when you're under higher level of stress. Um, last formal thing I have to cover is what's called the Aaron Fest classification of phase transition. Aaron Fest classification. Of phase transitions. And um, Aaron Fest classified phase transitions uh, based on which derivatives of the turn were discontinuous at the phase transition. So if the first derivatives of G are discontinuous then that's called a first order transition. And this is the one you're used to, right? This is the one I explained. The first derivatives are things like delta S. So entropy is a first derivative, volume is a first derivative. So that's the phase transitions that I would say 99% of the time you'll see uh, when you deal with materials in real life. 
uh, maybe not 99%, but 98%. So you can see how this is going to go, right? If the second derivatives of G are discontinuous, but I should say, but not the first. So the first ones are continuous, but the second derivatives are discontinuous. Um, that's what's called a second order transition. And, uh, you know, Aaron Fest, not to be outdone for his uh, penchant for theory classification, went for third order. And uh, I think I don't have to write this, right? You can see how it's going to go, right? Third order is where third derivatives are discontinuous, but not first and second. So let's analyze this for a second, because you're going to see that third order may not become all that relevant. So let's do second order. So what does it mean? So the first derivatives are not discontinuous. So that means that delta S at a phase transition is zero and delta V at the phase transition is zero as well, right? Because delta is the volume difference between the phases at the phase transition or the entropy difference. So that means physically no latent heat no dimensional changes. So if you're trying to detect a phase transition, a second order phase transition by doing typical experimental techniques like, um, you know, differential scanning calorimetry or TGA or any calorimetry, you're not going to hit pay dirt, right? Because there's no enthalpy of the transition. If you're going to try to study it with diffraction techniques, which is essentially a measurement of dimension or lattice parameters, you're not going to get it, right? Because there is no dimensional change at the transition. And this is why sometimes people miss second order transitions or don't even think they're real transitions. But let me tell you, they are real transitions. Now, what are the second order derivatives? So those are discontinuous. So the second order derivatives are the heat capacity. So delta CP at the transition is not zero and delta beta T is not zero. So at the transition, you have a discontinuity in heat capacity and in compressibility. So that indicates that there is truly a phase change because if you just had a continuous change of a material, these would not be discontinuous. Okay, so second order transitions are real. Um, where do they happen? Uh, most, well, all structural transitions are first order. Uh, typical second order transitions are um, uh, some, many magnetic transitions are not all. Uh, so, some order disorder transitions are second order, uh, not all. Uh, I think that's most of them. Let me actually show you a picture if I can get it up here. Okay, this is out of uh, uh, Defontaine's book. Uh, it's a sort of an older version of it, but he shows here first order transitions. This is the classic one, right? You get, uh, here's in, in temperature, you get a crossover at the phase boundary. And so at the phase boundary, you cross over with different slope. So there is a discontinuity in the uh, entropy, which is shown here, and a discontinuity in the heat capacity. So. If this were a second order transition, it would be very hard to see what's going on. The, the free energy curves, and, and this, this gets a little hard to draw, would, they would sort of do this thing where, like, like I said, it's hard to draw because even here I have a bit of a change in slope and I shouldn't have a change in slope. It gets easier to draw from the first derivatives on. So 
the, the entropy now has to be continuous at the transition, but it would, sorry. But it would do this change in curvature. Right? And the heat capacity, in principle, all the heat capacity needs to do is look like this. So have a discontinuity. But in reality, it does a little more. So in principle, this would be okay for a second order transition. You have a discontinuity in the heat capacity. Um, if you actually accurately calculate or measure the heat capacity, it actually does something different. Um, it has a logarithmic singularity and it would do this. Uh, and this singularity is uh, logarithmic so that you don't integrate uh, any infinity under it. So um, in reality, so Ehrenfest wasn't quite complete. In reality, uh, uh, C goes to infinity at, um, at T second order. And this is sort of of great interest to people who do statistical mechanics. It's been sort of, you know, it's been a topic for 50 years uh, of research. Um, it's one of the points where classical thermodynamic fails you because classical thermodynamics cannot explain the infinity. And the infinity comes from the fact that a second order transition, at the transition, the fluctuations of the system become infinitely large. So they, they reach the size of the system. And that's when thermodynamics fails because as we'll see later in statistic mechanics, uh, thermodynamics is all about averaging and there is now no averaging anymore because uh, for example, if you think of a ferromagnetic system, like, you know, with spin, magnetic spins up, you know, if, as, as you raise the temperature, right, one spin would flip down once in a while and lower the average magnetization. When you hit the second order transition, there are sort of waves of spin that flip over like a, a, like a grain field. Uh, and that wavelength gets longer and longer. And at the transition, it hits the dimension of the system. Uh, which is why the heat capacity goes to infinity. Uh, again, if you don't really want to remember this, I'm okay with that. I just wanted to sort of show you um, uh, that that's the case. For example, here is actually a, um, an example of the heat capacity in a magnetic transition uh, with zero applied field. And what you see is you see this beautiful divergence of the heat capacity uh, going to, to very high temperature. Okay. So once you know the free energy of all phases, you can plot the relative stability domains in some variable space, for example, pressure versus temperature. And you could demark the areas where everything's stable. And this is what's called a phase diagram. Of course, the best one we know is water, where the phase diagram looks something like this. Uh, here is the solid, here's the liquid, here's the vapor. So the regions you have here is you have single phase regions where only one phase exists. You have two phase, which is the lines. That's the boundary between the two. Hi, girl. You need to unshare your screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so you have single phase regions, you have two phase regions in a phase diagram, and then you have the triple point where three things, three phases coexist. Um, you see no discontinuities here in extensive variables because we plot this as a function of intensive variables. But as you cross one of these boundaries, for example, as you go from liquid to vapor, there is a discontinuity 
um, in the extensive variables. And for those of you who are used to, sorry, I'm running out of pens here that work actually. Um, for those of you who are used to plotting phase diagrams with an extensive variable, you know, if you're a mechanic and an engineer and you deal with uh, uh, water condensation and turbines, uh, you often plot in a PV space. And now how does, for example, the liquid vapor boundary look like? Well, when you cross this boundary, there's a large volume discontinuity. And so you see that volume discontinuity uh, in a PV diagram. So here you would be uh, low volume, right, liquid, and here you would be vapor. So at a given pressure, right, let's say we're at a given pressure, as you cross this line here, in a diagram like this, you cross this whole volume discontinuity. So we call this a two-phase region, but to see a two-phase region, sort of this continuity, you only get when you plot with extensive variables. And sadly, the, the way we plot phase diagrams, even when we go to like higher components, like two or three, we do a weird mismatch between intensive and extensive variables, right? So here we plot between two intensive variables, so you don't see the discontinuities. Here we plot one intensive, one extensive variable, so you see a discontinuity. When we plot um, binary systems, Right? When you get something like an uh, eutectic phase diagram, so you plot temperature versus composition, what is that? Right? That's one intensive versus one extensive variable. And that's why you see discontinuities. That's why you see two phase domains. And one of the things we'll do just for the sport of it later um, is actually replot some of these things with only uh, extensive variables. Um, I think it's boring to only show the phase diagram of water. So in my quest to show you real data on occasion, um, I picked up a bunch of phase diagrams of other materials that are more interesting than water. And I want to walk you through them. So let me share my screen again. It should be, it should be like a one button experience, right? Okay, water, we've done, water's boring. Bo okay, bismuth, here we go. So this is bismuth. And uh, the, you know, the first thing you see is like, uh, you should always take note of the scale, right? So we got temperature on the bottom, we got pressure on the top. Uh, we go to hundreds of kilobars here. And to put in perspective, 100 kilobar here, right, that's 10 GPA. And look at the action in this phase diagram, right? So bismuth is rhombohedral at low temperature, at low pressure. You can go tetragonal, you can go to a phase we haven't even named, phase four, phase five, phase eight, et cetera. So within, is 10, the question is, is 10 GPA a large pressure or not? It's actually pretty large, right, as a pressure. It's not that easy to apply uh, 10 GPA. You know, in your average lab, if you work with like a dye, it's pretty hard to even go to one GPA. Uh, if, of course, if you go to diamond anvils, you can go much higher. But, but the question is really, is it a large energy difference? And, and we've hit upon that. So I want to do a basic calculation, right? If these, ver if these phases in this range here are transformed into another by pressure, that's saying something about their energy difference. So we can estimate that because the energy difference has to come from the term P delta V. So what's the typical V of a solid? We've talked about that, right? You're talking about CCs per mole. 
of a solid is order a few cc per mole, let's say five to 10 cc per mole. So delta V is just a few percent of that. So I took delta V here to be 10 to the minus seven meters cubed per mole because I have to go to SI units, right? The CC is 10 to the minus six. So I took, you know, maybe 0.1 CCs for delta V. So what is the free energy difference between these phases? So the free energy difference is gonna be of the order of the pressure times delta V, where I assume delta V is like, not, I, is not dependent on pressure, right? So I just integrate this. So let me put in numbers, that's uh, 10 gigapascals, so that's 10 to the 10th pascals times 10 to the minus seven meter cubed per mole. So this is basically a thousand joules per mole or one kg or for the physicists among you, 10 MeV per atom. So that's not large at all, right? So what's go going on here is that it, in what seems to be like some massive amount of thermodynamic perturbation, right, 100 gigapascal seems like an enormous pressure, the phase is only can cross of the order of an energy difference, that's this. So it's not even as much as the thermal energy. Thermal energy at room temperature would be 25. At synthesis temperature, your thermal energy would be, you know, if you synthesize at a thousand degrees, it would be almost a hundred milli electron volt per atom, so 10 times more. So there's a few things you should learn about this, right? Pressure or mechanics is a weak force in thermodynamics. It, People attribute a lot to it, but the thing you should not attribute to it is change in the equilibrium relations or in the equilibrium behavior, unless the pressure is very large. The second thing you should remember is that it's hard to be a solid, right? It's a joke, right? No pun intended. I mean, look at how, what a competitive world it is. Within 10 MeV, there are one, two, three, four phases. So I've changed the thermodynamic boundary conditions by the equivalent of 10 MeV, right? 100 gigapascal applying to sort of delta Vs of the order of 10 to the minus seven. And I can induce phase transition between four different phases. So to me, this is still a, a remarkable statement, right? Solids, energy differences between solids are tiny. They are tiny between different phases. You think that rhombohedral bismuth and tetragonal bismuth and whatever phase four bismuth would have very different bonding characteristics. And the answer is no, not at all. They don't. Remember, the cohesive energy of bismuth is several electron volt. So what I'm saying is that all these phases which we all like to make cutesy theories about why we understand them, um, all live within, their, their cohesive energy is essentially the same. Their difference is 10 MeV out of multiple electron volts. So it's almost like how you arrange the atoms doesn't matter for the energy. On the scale of the cohesive energy, how you arrange the atoms is like, don't really care a few MeV here and there. It obviously cares because nature's also really good at finding its lowest free energy phase, which again is remarkable, right? So nature's working on a system here where the bonding is like five EV and it's finding how to make it go down to the last two milli EV, which is again, remarkable, right? Because it has to do that by breaking bonds, removing atoms, so it has to perturb things that are 5 EV to get its last milli electron volt uh, in breath. So quite remarkable, right? I think it's remarkable and cool. Uh, by the way, all these phase diagrams come out of a book, uh, Phase Diagrams of the Elements by Young, which is like every element is in there. Uh, okay, let's do iron. <clears throat> 
Iron, Ted Bundy has a face uh, named after him here. Okay, so iron, um, we're at the slightly lower pressure scale here, sort of up to 20, 30 gigapascal. Uh, if you look at the, the, the zero pressure or one um, atmosphere, you know, keep in mind that normal pressure is always at the bottom here, right? Because one atmosphere is nothing on this gigapascal scale. So we know that um, at normal pressure, you go BCC, if you raise the temperature, FCC, and then, oh, I should have done it here because of course you go BCC again, right? So you go BCC, FCC, and um, uh, BCC again. A few things to notice. Um, do you see that when you raise the pressure, the BCC field becomes uh, smaller, right? It's a bit confusing because it's written here, but this is actually the BCC field, the second BCC field. And this BCC field also becomes smaller. So FCC starts taking over. Why is that, you think? Just think thermodynamics, right? What affects Which physical variable affects the Gibbs free energy behavior with pressure? Uh, is it because FCC takes less space, so it has a so it has less volume? It's more packed. I think I got the right words. I don't know if I got them in the right order. It definitely has to do with volume, right? Because what is dV? Sorry. What is the GDP? It's V, right? So what I'm saying here is that the phase with the smallest volume gets the least free energy increase with pressure. So that's going to become more favorable and FCC is closer packed than BCC. So FCC wins over BCC, right? The BCC field gets smaller, this one even disappears and FCC gets bigger. And then at high temperature, uh, sort of high pressure, at some point, there is no less closed packed phase anymore. You only have the two closed packed phases, HCP and FCC. So HCP iron is an oddity, right? Um, it's kind of hard to make HCP iron uh, under normal conditions, uh, but it has been seen as precipitates in a matrix. So if you take an alloy and you precipitate out iron, and you precipitate it out coherently, uh, which is the early stage of precipitation, you sometimes see HCP iron, which for a long time people thought was a mistake, it couldn't be. Uh, but it makes sense, right? Because if you precipitate in a matrix, you are under enormous coherency stress, right? Because this matrix is enormous and is essentially imposing its volume on you. And that's the same as a very effective large pressure. And so you can see HCP, this phase is sort of consistent with the fact that you can observe HCP iron under highly constrained volume or, or lattice parameter conditions. Okay, let me show you a few more fun phase diagrams before we end. Sulfur. The two most complicated phase diagrams um, of the elements are sulfur and boron. And for similar reasons, um, uh, here's sulfur, tons of different phases. Most of them only have Roman numerals because most of them are dashed lines, so we don't exactly know how the phase boundary behaves. But sulfur has such a complicated phase diagram because sulfur essentially can uh, react with itself, right? Sulfur can be anything from metallic to anionic to cationic. And so it, it, it essentially um, can do anything, right? You can be a sulfur atom, you can dimerize to S2, uh, like a, 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 a like a peroxide dimer or or a disulfide dimer, you can become an anion. And and sulfur, just like boron, can be amphoteric in the sense that you know it can be a cation and an anion at the same time and make an ionic sol, uh, solid with itself. Um, as soon as you make these holes in sulfur, you can polymerize. So sulfur can polymerize with itself under high pressure, and it actually does that in the melt. Um, and that's why it has such a rich chemistry. Plutonium, not a good thing to show in Berkeley, but as you can imagine, um, phase diagram has had enormous uh, research done on it. Uh, it's actually kind of rich phase diagram under high pressure. 
I probably don't have to tell you why people care about high pressure uh, plutonium, uh, but I will anyway. The, the reason is that, um, uh, first of all, the forming of plutonium, uh, let's see, where are the phases here, right? So uh, where is alpha? Okay, the monoclinic phase of plutonium um, is brittle. So it uh, doesn't have enough slip systems to do good plastic deformation because it's monoclinic, right? You've learned about you need at least five slip systems, right? To do good plastic deformation. Um, so uh, it's very brittle and plutonium has to be machined highly accurately to make it into a weapon, right? Because remember that you make a sphere that then is collapsed onto itself to cause nuclear fusion. So you have machining of plutonium is very important. And people like these higher symmetry phases in particular like FCC uh, because FCC has higher symmetry, therefore you have uh, more uh, slip system. And, and so people try to kind of like figure out how to relate these uh, phases to each other, usually by alloying. But the other reason that you want the high pressure phases is because you want to know what happens to plutonium under pressure waves, right? You want to see what kind of rapid phase transitions can occur. Okay, um, hydrogen. Here's hydrogen. Uh, also super important phase diagram, in this case, going to really high pressure. And the reason is uh, why do people care about hydrogen? Uh, people wanna know what hydrogen looks like in the center of stars and planets. And, uh, and there's a whole debate about when you go from the, the low pressure phases, which are phases of H2, right? So they are solid phases where an H2 molecule is arranged in a certain pattern. For example, HEP, um, to at very high pressure, you should get delocalization of the hydrogen electrons and uh, hydrogen should, should become metallic. And metallic hydrogen behaves very differently, right? It has sort of uh, different eddy currents. It interacts differently with magnetic fields around the planet. So that's why um, that's uh, so bad. Okay. Now the Fias diagram with the largest discontinuity um, in value across the phase boundary. Um, as you go from here to here, this is carbon. Um, there is not only a delta V and a delta S, but there's also a delta dollar. Um, because of course, graphite is pretty dirt cheap and diamond is not. Um, as you can see from the phase diagram, graphite is the low temperature, low pressure phase but diamond is the high pressure phase. Uh, it has considerably lower um, molar volume than graphite, which is why, the high, um, why it's the high pressure phase. Um, surprisingly, maybe temperature actually makes this worse. Uh, I can give you some numbers. Let me give them now because we're gonna run out of time and you should calculate, you should calculate what at room temperature, um, the uh, transition pressure is. So delta G at normal conditions, so which I'll define as the G of diamond minus the G of graphite is uh, 2,898 joules per mole. So this is at the uh, room temperature, P is one atmosphere. And the volume of graphite, molar volume is 0.44 cc's per gram. The molar volume of diamond is uh, 0.28 cc's per gram. So use that information to estimate the transition pressure uh, to make graphite go into diamond. And you'll find that it's about, uh, at normal temperature, uh, it's about 15,000 atmosphere. So uh, 15 kilobar. So in principle, it shouldn't be that hard to transform graphite uh, into diamond. But in reality, of course, at room temperature, the kinetics are so bad because you're going from graphite, which is totally different bonding to diamond, that people want to do this at high temperature. But you see the problem here, right? At high temperature, uh, the transition pressure actually becomes much higher as well. Uh, so that doesn't work particularly well. Uh, so people do it by seeding now. And it's actually really not that hard anymore to make diamond uh, by seeded growth. So you take a small um, um, 
you take a small uh, diamond nucleus and you grow it uh, out of a carbon containing atmosphere under high pressure and you can make diamond. Uh, there's only one reason why diamond is still expensive and it is the beers, right? The company who controls almost all the diamond trade uh, in the world. It's a sort of a, uh, it, it's really a mineral that is sort of artificially uh, inflated in price. Um, because the way you see that is in the business of industrial diamond for cutting tools, uh, diamond is not nearly as expensive as um, diamond uh, gemstones. So, um, okay, let's see. And of course, this is also why diamond is made in the core of the earth, right? Why it's made under, um, under high pressure. Uh, it, it, um, under very high pressure, uh, uh, carbon containing deposits transform to diamond. And it's only when they come back to the surface because of movement of tectonic plates uh, that we can get the diamond, right? Do you remember the movie, The Core? Is it called The Core? I think so, right? Ever seen the movie, The Core? I think it's called the core where they send uh, uh, a ship into the core of the earth because the earth's rotation has started to go funky and they have to set up an explosion in, inside, in, in the inner core of the earth and they have this ship that melts all the rock in front of them and it spews it out at the back. So that's how they propel themselves through the, through the mantle and through getting into the core. But then at some point they start hitting things uh, and the ship starts wildly shaking and they start hitting things that they, that they can't melt and, and somebody shouts and they're these, this, these, this big, these things that they hit and people say, it's diamonds, it's giant diamonds. Anyway, you should watch that. Maybe I'll put it on the next, uh, on the next episode of this class. Okay, uh, that was all I had to say for now. Um, I'll, if you have any questions, uh, oh, although I'm already over time. But I'll see you, today is Wednesday. I'll see you on Friday. So Friday is a lecture. Uh, it's the last lecture before the midterm. And then uh, what we've done is we've shifted the discussion to Monday so that you have that extra discussion before uh, the midterm on, on uh, Wednesday. Uh, I'll have office hours on Friday, 1.15, but I do have a sharp cutoff at two. So if you, if you wanna talk to me and if you think there's more people that wanna talk to me, we can always set up uh, extra time as well. So cool. Anyway, enjoy your uh, Wednesday morning. So thank you.